Let's describe complex numbers using Cartesian coordinates. I'm going to start off by drawing a diagram of the complex plane. So we're going to have, first of all, we're going to have the origin. And the origin, I'm going to put roughly over here. And through the origin, we're going to have the horizontal axis. And this is actually the real axis. And the vertical axis is going to be the imaginary axis. So this guy is the imaginary axis. I'm going to label this as the real component of a complex number z. And this guy is going to be the imaginary component of a complex number z. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a complex number. And we're going to put it over here. It's going to be some random dot. And just for convenience, I'm going to put it in the upper right quadrant. And I'm going to draw a line that goes up to here. So we're going to treat this kind of like a vector in two dimensions. So this is not the same as a two-dimensional vector space. Complex numbers are a little bit different. There's different things you can do with complex numbers. You can multiply them. Uh, you can express them in polar coordinates. And there are a lot more uh, interesting number systems than just the real number system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this guy up into its real component and its imaginary component. And then we're going to use a system of coordinates that's similar to the Cartesian coordinate system. So I'm going to draw a line that goes down over here. And I'm going to draw a line that goes down over here. And this guy, I'm going to call i times y. y is the imaginary component of this complex number. And over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this x. And x is the real component. So I'll write this in the top over here. x, we're going to use to denote the real component of the complex number z. And y is going to be the imaginary component of z. And here's, here's an important convention. i times y is not the imaginary component. i is the imaginary unit. y is the imaginary component. So y by itself is the imaginary component. And y is a real number. Both x and y are real numbers. So I'll write that over here. x and y are both elements of the real numbers. So I'm using this fancy r to denote the real numbers. So both of these guys are in the real numbers. But we're using this imaginary unit i to multiply the imaginary component. So the imaginary numbers exist up over here on this vertical axis. And all of the complex numbers have some combination of real and imaginary components. So the real numbers are a special case of the complex numbers. They are the complex numbers that have an imaginary component of 0. So if you set y equal to 0, you just lie on the real axis. That's the horizontal axis over here. So this guy I'm going to call z, and it's going to be equal to x plus i y. So x plus i y. So this is a lot like uh, vectors in two dimensions, where you split up the vector into its horizontal and vertical component. But as we said, it's not exactly the same. There are some very important differences between vector spaces and complex numbers. So x over here, that's the real component. y is the imaginary component. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define the complex conjugate. Now the complex conjugate is the mirror image of the complex number z. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the mirror image, I'm going to reflect it, and it's actually going to have the exact same real component, but its imaginary component is going to be negated. So we're going to have, over here, we're going to have minus i times y. So this is actually the same distance but it's in the opposite direction. It's in the downward direction. This is the negative uh, axis, and this is the negative imaginary axis. So we've got minus i y. So this distance and this distance are the same, and these distances are also the same. So both of these guys actually share this component. And I'm going to draw a line over here, and this line is uh, kind of like a representation of the magnitude of this guy. We can actually we can draw a little arrow over here. We can treat these guys kind of like vectors. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to label this. I'm going to move this label a tiny bit to the right so I can draw this little dotted line that goes down over here. So this guy, this is x. They both share the same real component. So this guy is the complex conjugate. And I can label this con complex conjugate with a little star. So it's z star. And that is going to be equal to x minus i y. That's x minus i y. So what is what has changed over here? We've just introduced a minus sign, and we've changed i to minus i. So changing i to minus i 
is the process of complex conjugation. So that's the complex conjugate. Sometimes you might also see Z with a bar on top. That can also denote the complex conjugate. That's exactly the same as uh, this little star. So that's just a different notation. Because sometimes bars are going to be used for different things, and sometimes stars are going to be used. So another notation you might also see, uh, this is more if you have matrices and you're taking the Hermitian conjugate, is this little cross. So it's like a little dagger on the top. And this dagger is also the same as complex conjugating. But it's not complex conjugating a number, it's complex conjugating a matrix. And if you complex conjugate a matrix, you can't just take the complex conjugate, you have to also take the transpose. But we won't go into details of matrices yet. That's going to be in later videos in the quantum mechanics playlist. But just note that these guys are all describing a similar process. We're taking the complex conjugate. We're finding the mirror image. right? So this is the mirror image of uh, a complex number. So these guys are concerned with a number. This guy is actually concerned with a matrix. And this, this would actually have to be a matrix if we wanted to take the Hermitian conjugate. So let's go back to this over here. We have a complex number z, and we have the complex conjugate of that complex number z. And the only difference is that there's a minus sign over here. What happens if you take the complex conjugate of the complex conjugate? Well, if you take this minus i, and you turn that back to minus minus i, that's going to turn to plus i. So the complex conjugate of the complex conjugate gets you back to where you started. So I can write that out over here, z star with a star is actually the same as z. So complex conjugating twice gets you back to where you started. That's a very useful property. Uh, another thing I want to actually show you is how you can get the magnitude of this vector over here. So it's not exactly a vector of this complex number. So let's take the magnitude of this guy. We take the magnitude, and let's actually take the magnitude squared, because that's easier to calculate. What we can do is we can actually define that as z times z star. So z times z star, that is going to give us the magnitude squared. And if you take real numbers over here, if you just focus on numbers that lie on the horizontal axis, then this is going to be equal to this, right? For real numbers, z is equal to z star. So then you just have a look at the definition for squaring, right? Squaring a number is the same as multiplying the number by itself. But here's the thing. For complex numbers in general, the complex conjugate is not equal to the number itself. There is some imaginary component that gets negated. So these guys are not necessarily equal. So how does this look like algebraically? So let's actually write this out. This is going to be equal to x plus iy times x minus iy. So this guy is z, and this is z star. That's the complex conjugate. And if we multiply these guys together, we're going to get x times x, which is x squared. And we're also going to get iy times minus iy. But i and minus i, they're actually multiplicative inverses. Another way of looking at it is i times i gives you i squared. i squared is minus 1. Then we actually have two minus signs. Minus and a minus give us a plus. So this is going to give us a plus y squared. Now what's going to happen to these mixed terms? Well, these mixed terms are going to look like this. They're both going to have a factor of i. But the first uh, one over here, the one from we get from the inside, is going to be x times y. And the one we get from the outside is going to be x times y with a minus sign. So we'll have x times y with a minus sign. And this is going to cancel. This is going to give us 0. So we're going to get 0 from these guys because the mixed terms cancel. So what is that going to tell us? The only terms that remain are x squared and y squared. So that means that the magnitude squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. So that is what this is telling us. The magnitude squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. And this is exactly Pythagoras' theorem. So Pythagoras' theorem just tells you that x squared plus y squared is equal to the square of the hypotenuse. And this over here is actually the square of the hypotenuse. If I write it over here, the magnitude of z is over here. And this is also the magnitude of z. That's the length of this line. So that's why I've drawn this as a little arrow. We're drawing it exactly the same as we would draw a vector in two dimensions. So this is very important. This is how you find the magnitude of a complex number. And this is why it works. One uh, little thing I want to explain in this little step over here. Uh, if we have, so I'll just write this out in full, i 
times minus i is actually equal to minus i squared. But we know that i squared is equal to minus 1. So what we have is minus times minus 1, and that's the same as plus 1. So that's actually how we went from this times this to here. So we had iy times minus iy, and these guys combine together to give a plus 1. That's because these guys are actually multiplicative inverses of each other. So this guy times this guy is going to give a multiplicative identity. And the multiplicative identity is 1. So 1 is the thing that you multiply by and you don't actually change the number. That's why it's called the multiplicative identity. So i times minus i gives you a minus sign. We can factor that out. That's i squared. And i squared is by definition equal to minus 1. And the two minuses cancel to give us plus 1. So this is the Cartesian coordinate system applied to complex numbers. We're going to be using the Cartesian coordinate system a lot because this is very convenient for adding complex numbers. If you add complex numbers, they work very, very well in Cartesian coordinates. But multiplying complex numbers in Cartesian coordinates is a little tedious. You can see over here, I've just multiplied a number by its complex conjugate, and that was a little tedious to do. A much more uh, simple and elegant way of multiplying complex numbers is using polar coordinates. And that's what we're going to introduce in the next video. We're going to look at complex numbers in polar coordinates. And then we're going to see how we can easily multiply complex numbers. Because this form is far uh, more convenient for addition, but it's not very convenient for multiplication. So hopefully this video was helpful. If you want to see more videos just like this one, make sure to check out the Quantum Mechanics playlist. You can find it if you click over here.